Many often treat the Eastern Front with a degree of disparity regarding both Soviet and German combat performances. The Soviet Stavka often being relegated to cavemen directing the faceless hordes against a seemingly superior foe, that being Germany. And there's something seriously wrong with this generalization, as I see it come up far too often, however I won't be covering that in this video. But there is something to be said about the almost mythological character being given to the obviously talented German generals, such as Guderian and Manstein. As this imbalance in prestige is highlighted in no greater microcosm than with the generals' feuds with Hitler. In the post-war period, the West was littered with countless memoirs from disgruntled German generals who essentially laid all the blame for strategic errors on Hitler. This helped reinforce the attitudes that German generals were of a higher vocational quality than their former foes, since they used Hitler as a scapegoat to explain major blunders like Stalingrad and Kursk. But this myth of dictatorial blunders is truly shattered in no place other than the Soviet capital itself, Moscow. In early October 1941, the Red Army was facing bleak prospects at defending the capital city. Several operational axes were to be established along important transportation arteries, with a certain emphasis on Volokolamsk, as this is where both the initial German offensive and later Soviet counteroffensives started from. In the midst of all this stood the Western Front commanded by the newly appointed Georgi Zhukov. German forces had just encircled massive Soviet formations west of Vyazma and around Bryansk, resulting in about half a million prisoners. Many of these units would continue to stage vital delaying actions, allowing the continuation of construction of the Mosaisk defensive line. However, according to the Soviet general staff, many assigned forward units were unable to systematically withdraw to the line due to the risk of breakouts, forcing the Stavka to deploy reserves. The line was divided into four fortified areas, namely Kaluga, Maroyaroslavets, Mozaisk, and Volokolamsk, with the last being the most important. However, the rapid advance of German forces forced a premature deployment of the line, with the Kaluga sector being totally unprepared. Germany's desire at taking Moscow would essentially involve two major offensives directed at enveloping actions to the north and south of the city, thus inviting encirclement to nearby Soviet forces. The infamously muddy Russian wet season known as the Rasputitsa also slowed the German advance toward Moscow in concert with the hastily prepared Mosaisk Line. Even with German attempts at bypassing the main sectors of fortification, the line proved vital as a delaying action, especially with the success brought forth from the defense of Volokolamsk and Maroyaroslavets. Such defined actions were clearly reciprocated by Hitler, who on October 12th issued an order to essentially starve out Moscow using similar strategies employed in the Siege of Leningrad. Nonetheless, the German juggernaut continued its approach to Moscow. By November, the average temperature was sufficiently cold for muddy conditions to subside and for a renewed German offensive. Under the order of the Moscow Military District, over 250,000 civilians continued preparations for a layered defense around the capital, including vital anti-aircraft defenses. This defense system was seen as so important that construction continued even in the onset of the successful Soviet December counteroffensive, having been completed on the 31st of December, just in time for the new year. However, not all was well for Germany as the attrition on the Eastern Front had taken its toll. Although 136 divisions existed on paper, having been deployed in the East, they reportedly had the strength of just 83 full divisions. The Germans were also lacking in reserve units, whereas this was not the case for the Soviet Union. 
The Germans would nonetheless attempt for a second offensive to Moscow on November 14th. Although 2nd Panzer Army under the command of Heinz Guderian had initial setbacks in the October period, it pursued its November objectives with General East and attempted to encircle Tula from the south. The desperation on part of the Soviets began to show with reckless operations such as the ill-fated cavalry charge by the 44th Mongolian Cavalry Division. However, by mid-November, fatigue was starting to show, and there only remained 50 tanks left to continue the spearhead. The German attack in the north was more successful, having captured Klin and reaching the Moscow-Volga Canal. It was from this sector that German officers could allegedly see the spires of the great city through their field glasses. In addition, the Germans planned diversionary frontal attacks in order to distract from the north and south pincers. However, on the 1st of December, the German 4th Army met remarkable Soviet resistance in Narofominsk. To the south, the Soviet 1st Guards Cavalry Corps also attacked the 17th Panzer Division near Kashira, thus relieving pressure from Tula. Even with local air superiority, the Germans could not maintain their positions against fresh Soviet reserves. These units being deployed on the east banks of the Moscow-Volga Canal and Ryazan sectors in order to stop a possible German encirclement of the capital. The German juggernaut had come to a halt. German command grew anxious at the prospect of a wider frontal envelopment threatening Army Group Center, and as a result, the Army Group was to receive priority and reinforcements. However, even for the Soviets, many of their formations lacked effectiveness particularly the numerous ski battalions attached to the front. This was because many of the soldiers lacked even basic ski training, thus having limited mobility. However, by February, no reinforcements were assigned to the Torapet sector, thus alleviating German concerns for wider envelopment. However, such prospects did not necessarily matter, and the Soviet counteroffensive began at precisely 3 a.m. on Friday, December the 5th, 1941. In frigid temperatures, the first shock army charged through to Klin, with attacks from Konev's Kalinin front and south of Klin, the target to encircle the 3rd Panzer Group and accompanying units. A similar encirclement was attempted against Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army, however this achieved rather limited success. By mid-December, there were frenzied withdrawals across the front with heavy loss of equipment. Over 3 million rifle rounds alone were supposedly lost in operations around Klin, only to be captured by the Soviet 30th Army. Although Hitler ordered limited withdrawals through Directive No. 39, he grew anxious at the loss of artillery due to the lack of transport. In addition, an unauthorized withdrawal by Guderian led to the destruction of the 45th, 95th, and 134th Infantry Divisions to his southern flank. This goes to show that there was some sense to be made with the famous Stand Fast Order of December the 18th. Although the Soviet counteroffensive had already traversed close to 200 kilometers by the end of December, there was some reason for Hitler to hold such a militant attitude to the situation. Widespread fear of moral panic mimicking the 1812 retreat of French forces from Moscow was a very real concern. Such disagreements with the military would inevitably lead to the resignation of Army Group Center's commander, von Bach, although he cited health issues. He was replaced by von Kluge, who then proceeded to relieve Guderian on Christmas Day. What a present. Historian David Glantz, however, noted regarding the Stand Fast Order that what Hitler never recognized was that the Soviet counteroffensive of 1941 to 1942 might well have destroyed Army Group Center had not Stalin tried to do too much, too fast. This has some truth as the relatively weak Soviet counteroffensive became overextended with a secondary general offensive that began in January the 7th, 1942, along the entire Eastern Front. However, his peer Jonathan Howe stated that although Hitler may have introduced the order for the wrong reasons, it became of particular importance given that a mass German withdrawal would have negated the Germans' vital winter shelter. This was nowhere more evident than the use of pre-existing Soviet fortifications by German forces that retreated to the Lama River defensive line. 
Apart from this, the average temperature in January 1942 was negative 19 Celsius, far colder than the usual January temperature. Logistical problems also negated Germans of winter clothing that would have led to conditions similar to the Grand Army's retreat. However, what also goes unmentioned is the fact that the Germans halted the Soviet counteroffensive precisely along the line that von Bock wanted to initially withdraw to. This may be the case even though the staggered defense employed by Hitler in places like the Lama River would have significantly made it easier to hold. Even then, the second Soviet counteroffensive was too deadly for a full German withdrawal. The Soviet counteroffensive was simple. They planned on using the Kalinin Front to penetrate Army Group Center from the north and the Western Front in order to make several penetrations in Volokolamsk and Mozaisk. The objective ultimately being to squeeze German forces into the Vyazma sector, thus destroying Army Group Center. Several other offensives were ordered toward Torpets and Bryansk in order to alleviate pressure in the central sector. On the Kalinin front, the 39th and 29th armies were thus able to penetrate the rear of the German 9th army, opening a narrow gap behind enemy lines. Western Front units also managed to break through the Lama Ruza River defense line. Preceding the second Soviet offensive, there also existed a wide gap in the Kaluga sector between the second Panzer Army and the fourth army, which invited exploitations by the 10th and 16th armies along with the first guard's cavalry corps. However, the juggernaut of the offensive was the incredibly mobile 33rd army that initiated its penetration near Narofominsk. The area around the 33rd Army had better infrastructure than other sectors of the front, thus allowing the army to reach Vyazma, only to be cut down and encircled by German forces. Bad news also spread to the 1st Guard's cavalry corps, which was also cut off from the front line. Fatigue and overextension promptly halted the offensive, thus allowing the gaps to be filled by the Germans in other sectors of the front. Because of this, in the ensuing months, the Germans were able to slowly cut off and liquidate various Soviet units with such narrow frontage, especially in the central sector. To combat this, several airborne operations were conducted by the Soviets in the newly formed Ryzev salient in order to keep the pockets operational, but these achieved limited success. By February, the Soviets had failed at destroying Army Group Center, and thus created significant German salience in Yuknov, Demyansk, and Kolm. That being said, I am more inclined to agree with House, as the Germans lost massive amounts of artillery pieces, lacked sufficient transport, and would have been exposed to the elements. A microcosm of such a potential disaster was best exemplified by the encirclement and destruction of the German 34th Army Corps. Soviet partisans had also cut off further supplies, reminiscent of Kozak horsemen, thus making a withdrawal riskier. It was also paradoxical that although Germany had a larger GDP than the USSR, it was vastly outproduced in nearly every armament metric due to the overmobilization of the Soviet labor force. This would thus magnify any potential loss of equipment Germany suffered. Apart from this, I'd also like to mention that Hitler's standfast order didn't last too long, as Hitler begrudgingly gave way to his first wartime withdrawal order on January the 15th, 1942. However, such a staggered and tenacious defense would have proved pivotal due to all the aforementioned reasons. Although Glantz makes a good point on Stalin's overambitious attitude with the offensive, the Soviet army really wasn't in a position to make any decisive exploitations. For example, on July 15, 1941, the Stavka issued Circular No. 1, which abolished mechanized corps as there was a shortage in tanks. It was only in March 1942 that a small combined arms mechanized corps was designed, which would still prove too little even for a panzer division. So even with the hesitance issued by both Glantz and Zhukov, there was an armor disparity that would have negated the Soviets' offensive power should they have focused on smaller focal points. 
Apart from that, the Standfast Order would have had a morale-boosting effect similar to Stalin's Order No. 227, which General Alexander Vasilevsky highly praised. And although Hitler seemed guided by an ill-thought-out fixed mentality reminiscent of World War I trench warfare, it is of my opinion that this order truly saved the Wehrmacht and Army Group Center from certain doom. Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed uh, the documentary on the Battle of Moscow. It took me quite a long time to do. I had to do a lot of visuals and whatnot. Um, so. In order to sort of supplement my enthusiasm, I've set up a, a Patreon page where you can donate and you'll get perks like little monthly letters. Right now I'm walking around the town I live in, so I'm going to put the description somewhere on the, on the screen to the link. So hope you donate, you don't have to. Anyway, keep enjoying my videos. Bye!